On May 10, 1996, on the world's highest peak, the day began with ambition but ended in tragedy. Climbers high up on Mount Everest were hit by the deadliest storm ever, trapping people in what's known as the death zone, a place where the air is too thin, too cold, and the terrain too treacherous for any margin of error. For nearly 30 years, people have grappled with the mystery of what truly happened on that fateful climb. Was it the flawed judgment of seasoned leaders or just a consequence of climbing the world's highest mountain? While many have speculated on what happened, we're going to dive deep into the stories from the climbers themselves. Welcome to part two of my 1996 Everest series. You may want to see part one, but I'm adding in enough information that you won't be super lost if you haven't seen part one. We left off as the Scott Fisher and Rob Hall teams finished up their acclimatization routines. That meant climbing higher and higher multiple times over six weeks so they could slowly adjust to the altitude. By this time, many people were feeling really horrible, which is pretty normal at this time on Everest. It's just a result of the exposure to the high altitude, the stomach bugs that they got, and the incessant coughing that most people had. A huge issue going into the final summit climb was that Rob and Scott both planned for their big teams to summit on the same day. Lou Kosischke was on Rob's team and he was a pretty experienced climber and very vocal about this plan. He didn't agree with it. He said Rob had never joined forces with another team and these were two of the largest expeditions on the mountain that year. Too many climbers in certain spots on the mountain can create these lineups which lead to delays and delays this high can be deadly. The climb to the summit has to be within a certain time frame, usually around 12 hours, from the highest camp to the summit. The climb back down to camp four is about six hours. And they wanna get back to camp four before dark, which is about 6.30 p.m. And if there's delays, that means that people will also run out of supplemental oxygen, as there's only about 18 hours of oxygen for each person. And running out of oxygen in the death zone can mean a quick death. Anatoly Bukriv was a guide on Scott's Mountain Madness team, and he also expressed concern about the decision to join forces and told Scott that Rob's clients could slow them up because they were a slower team overall. And many climbers on the team felt the same way. But for whatever reason, Scott and Rob were determined to join forces. Lou said in his book that the most important part of any summit day plan is the turnaround time. This is the time climbers turn around on the mountain no matter where they are and they head back down. Lou believed that ignoring this time would be unsafe, irresponsible and reckless. Rob set the turnaround time for 1 p.m. and emphasized to his team that if you're not back in camp in daylight, you will die. Rob's team was leaving Camp 4 for the summit around 11 p.m., so Lou thought that the turnaround time should have been around 11 a.m., giving them 12 hours to get up there. And Rob's turnaround time was only possible in the most ideal circumstances. If everything went perfect, they'd be up and back at 5 p.m., 12 hours up and 6 hours back. Journalist John Krakauer, who was on Rob's team, said that Rob lectured them for weeks on the mountain on the importance of the turnaround time. Rob told them that everyone had to abide by this time no matter where they were on the mountain. He also said that with enough determination, any bloody idiot can get up this hill. The trick is to get back down alive. Beck Weathers recalls Rob saying, if you're not moving fast enough to get to the summit by 2 p.m., you're not moving fast enough to get down before darkness traps you on the mountain forever. And according to all of the clients on Scott's team, he really didn't have a specific turnaround time. Though most climbers know that the conventional time was 1 or 2 p.m., but Scott never explicitly gave his team a time. Instead, he would kind of just see how things were going and then set a turnaround time while climbing, or he would turn back the weaker clients as he climbed at the back of the team. The team spent a week resting before their final push to the summit on May 6th. Anatoly felt that hiking beyond base camp further down to lower elevation would be even better for rest. He suggested to Scott that everyone descend to Debouche, a village in the forest at about 3,800 meters or 12,500 feet, and that's where the oxygen-rich atmosphere would promote a better physical recovery. But Scott consulted with Rob and they decided against it. They were worried that their team might catch a stomach bug lower down, which was highly possible because a lot of people caught stomach bugs as they were hiking in. 
But Anatoly decided to go down to Debouchet by himself, which is about a 20 kilometer or 12 mile hike. He was disappointed that Scott, Neil, and some other clients hadn't done the same. On May 5th, Anatoly noticed Sandy Hill Pittman was gone. And if you don't know about Sandy, she's the New York socialite that everybody loves to hate. She had descended with her three Sherpas to meet three of her friends who had hiked into Farishé. And this is about a 12 and a half kilometer or eight mile hike from Everest Base Camp. It surprised Anatoly that someone with her experience in the mountains would make such a rapid descent and return on the same day just before a summit bid. An extended rest is beneficial, but a quick up and down would cost her a great deal of energy. Charlotte Fox and Tim Madsen, they were a couple from Colorado, and Charlotte was like the queen of mountaineering in Colorado. And if you read some of the comments on her, everybody just seems to love Charlotte, and she just seemed like an awesome human being. Um, she had a ton of experience, had done all the climbs that you could possibly do in Colorado, and had climbed all over the world. But Anatoly was concerned with their acclimatization because they hadn't yet spent a night at Camp 3 like everybody else. But Scott was going to let them ascend anyways, and he would monitor their progress. And Anatoly didn't know it at the time, but Tim and Charlotte actually had their own concerns about summiting. They told Scott that they didn't want to go on the planned summit day. Instead, they wanted to wait a little bit longer and try acclimatizing properly before they went for the summit. But Scott had to maintain a timeline and this group of people, and he wasn't able to do another summit bid in addition to the one they were already going to do. So they were kind of stuck with that summit day. While Charlotte didn't address the conversation with Scott and anything that I've seen from her, she did say that she'd been struggling with exercise-induced asthma and a lung infection, but both were under control at the time thanks to some medicine she was taking. She said Tim had a lot of headaches and that during rest time they'd go all the way down to Farishé to recover. Anatoly said other clients were no better or no worse than he expected, but Scott was having problems. He also couldn't understand why Scott and Neil had hiked to Pomori to take photos. Pomori is a mountain about 8 kilometers or 5 miles so west of Everest. I'm not sure how high they climbed on this mountain, but they did spend the night there, and Neil said that it was a nice break from everybody else and for them to be alone and kind of discuss the upcoming summit plans. But this was an expensive energy that Anatoly just felt wasn't necessary. And he later learned that Scott developed an illness over that week and had begun taking antibiotics. He also took medication to help with acclimatization, so he was obviously having some issues. Sandy returned to base camp the night before their final push to the summit. The next morning at 5 a.m., she was back at work in her communications tent. The internet dispatch she sent out was upbeat, enthusiastic, and strangely focused on her meal at the restaurant the night before, which Anatoly found quite odd, considering what they were just about to do. In two hours, they were going to be climbing to the summit of Mount Everest. And it's odd that she didn't mention that. That morning, Martin Adams of Scott's team went into the mess tent for breakfast and saw Scott and the doctor in a deep conversation that he said looked tense. He said whatever they were discussing, they didn't want to share it with others. So it makes you wonder if the doctor was questioning Scott's ability to climb and was the doctor noticing his exhaustion like other people were. And while still at base camp, Scott's head Sherpa Lopsang also took an unexpected trip. He had to go back to Kathmandu with his injured uncle, and Lopsang had to rush back to base camp, so he didn't properly acclimatize. And at this point, Lou had serious intestinal problems that he said were almost mental torture. Part of him was embarrassed to have to consider not attempting the summit bid due to diarrhea, so he was just going to go for it. So the next morning, his alarm went off at 3.45 a.m. on May 6th. He went to the mess tent and he could just feel the tension. People were quiet. This was their last move up the mountain and they were nervous. Rob, though, moved around with his usual confidence and they were now four days from the highest point on earth. Despite some climbers battling sickness, others not acclimatizing properly, and everyone being nervous, the summit bid was still a go. On May 6th, the plan was to climb to Camp 2, and that would take about 7 to 10 hours. They'd spend the night at Camp 2 resting, evaluating conditions, and making those final summit plans. On May 8th, they would climb straight up to Camp 3, and this would take about 3 hours. On the morning of May 9th, if everything was still a go, they'd climb further up the Lhotse face to Camp 4 at about 7,924 meters, or 26,000 feet, just below the death zone. This would take about three to five hours. There, they'd rest for only a few hours, and then, if everything was still a go, 
They'd continue the climb later that night to the summit. It would take them about 12 hours to get to the summit, so they'd arrive around 11 to 12 the next day. Then they'd turn around and be back at Camp 4 before dark. And an interesting thing to note here is that in the previous 5 to 10 years before this, an average of only three days were doable summit days. That's where the weather was good enough to make the climb. It was a very, very small window. And this year, that window hadn't quite opened up yet. And there was no official forecast to help with this. Rather, it was just a judgment call of really monitoring and understanding the weather patterns. The leaders who were paid to make these critical decisions failed to see that the weather window had, in fact, not opened up yet. The climb from base camp to camp two would take climbers about five to seven hours. It's only about 2.5 miles from camp one to two, so it's not very far, but it's very, very hot. The sun reflects off the walls and can make the temperatures over 37 degrees Celsius or 100 Fahrenheit. But some of the climbers were just super happy that they were gonna be done climbing up that dreaded ice fall. On the morning of May 9th, Anatoly met with Scott after breakfast. Scott had stayed behind to ensure that all the clients got off okay and they both agreed that Anatoly would head up last to save his strength and move at his own pace to Camp 2. Scott's team started arriving at Camp 1 and Dale Cruz wasn't doing well. Dale was a friend of Scott's who was the most inexperienced climber on the team. Rob had to tell Dale that his summit attempt was over, so he ended up climbing all the way down to base camp with Dale, which was a huge expense of Scott's energy, and they ran into Anatoly on the way down. Anatoly's version of this is that he ran into Scott and Dale as they were coming down the ice fall and he offered to take Dale down the rest of the way because he said Scott looked upset, but Scott told him that he would do it himself. And this is where Crack Hour's account differs. He heard the story from Dale, who said that Anatoly was asked to stay at the rear of the group to keep an eye on everybody. But Anatoly ignored this, slept late, took a shower, and departed base camp five hours behind the last clients. So when Dale ran into trouble, Anatoly was nowhere to be seen. And Dale says that this is where Scott laid into Anatoly for not climbing with the team. But then again, Dale wasn't the biggest fan of Anatoly. He said that Anatoly had poor social skills and didn't watch out for people. And Anatoly didn't really speak English very well. He was Kazakhstan and he spoke Russian and his accent was very thick. So I think people had trouble understanding him and that could have affected how he related socially to people because some people really loved him. Dale told Scott that he didn't want to climb with Anatoly any higher on the mountain because he didn't know if he could count on him when it mattered. Meanwhile, one of Scott's team members, 68-year-old Pete Schoening, had also gone back to base camp. So that meant that two members of Scott's team were now out of the summit bid. So Scott rested at base camp for a while and then headed back up that ice fall and ran into Henry Todd of Himalayan Guides. Henry admitted that Scott was way faster than him usually, yet they were going up at the same pace. And he asked Scott why he was down here at back at base camp, and he said Scott started tearing up when he told him about Dale, and he was also coughing quite a bit. Henry said that Scott was burning himself up and that he knew Scott wasn't well. And he said Scott's parting words to him were, I'm worried about these people, and I'm worried about the situation. Lena said Scott wasn't his usual self right from the start. He went on a huge expedition to Mount Kilimanjaro in January of 1996 and he had a very tough schedule from then until now. She said, I was shocked at how exhausted he was. He was totally exhausted and kept getting sick. So I suggested that he really needed to rest. Maybe he had to rest for half a year because his whole life he had been pushing himself and so far he was able to cope with it because he was very, very strong physically and she knew that he was struggling with his personal limits. He wrote her a letter before Everest saying he had to learn to be humble because he didn't want to die in the mountains. Most people who climb Everest do it with supplemental oxygen. It helps in two ways. It decreases the altitude that you feel and therefore prevents or reduces the effects of severe hypoxia. And it also keeps you warm by allowing the blood to flow more freely to your extremities. The drawbacks are that it's really heavy to carry the oxygen bottles, especially when you're really tired, and flow rates need to be low so it lasts a long time. And one of the big debates is whether Anatoly should have used oxygen or not as a guide. And it seems the consensus is that most people, including Everest veterans and guides who are experts, that he should have used it because it 
You work at your best when you have supplemental oxygen, especially when you're responsible for other people's lives. But Anatoly says that he and Scott discussed his use of oxygen and that Scott was okay with him not using it. In fact, Lopsang wasn't going to use oxygen either, and Scott, he said, was even considering not using it as well. Many people later said that Scott insisted his guides climb with oxygen, but if you believe Anatoly's account, Scott was okay with two guides climbing without it, and he was considering not using it himself. The climb from Camp 2 to 3 takes about 4 to 6 hours. Sherpas fix ropes all the way up the Lhotse face, and it's critical that climbers stay attached to the rope at all times. Every year, at least one death occurs here, and most are because a climber just failed to clip in properly. And this is where the altitude really starts to affect people. Here they're at about 7,000 meters or 23,000 feet. On the morning of May 7th, after a brief delay due to high winds, the team's headed towards Camp 3. On the way, Anatoly ran into the IMAX team who was coming down from their summit attempt. Ed Viesters, the Everest veteran who was on the IMAX team this year, told Anatoly they were coming down because they didn't like the weather, that it was too unstable, and they were going to hang back for a few days just to see if it would stabilize. They also didn't want other climbers in the background of their shots, and they thought that so many people in the same area was too risky in terms of safety. Ed said they spent a windy night at Camp 3 and saw that it was still windy up high, so they knew that it wasn't the weather window that they were looking for, so they were going to wait. Ed actually said that he felt a bit sheepish coming down because everyone else was going up. He and David were questioning their decision. Then they ran into leaders Rob and Scott who were surprised they were heading back down. That made the IMAX team question their decision even more. But they just told them that we're going down, it just doesn't feel right. So you have to wonder, these Everest veterans were going down because of the weather, but Rob and Scott were going up. Were they experiencing summit fever, which is the compulsion to make it to the summit no matter the cost? Ed said he'd seen it before. He said if eight climbers head up, they'll pull up ten more climbers with them. They think so-and-so is going, so why not? We should be going too. But on Everest, like any mountain, you've got to make your own decisions. So they all gave each other a big hug. They were all friends and they all had been climbing together for years and they said, have a great trip and stay safe. Rob told Ed that he'd see him back at base camp, to which Ed replied, I'll buy you a beer when you get back down. Ed had kept a close eye on the weather over the previous week. Every afternoon the clouds would roll up high and it was far too windy along the summit ridge to climb. That magical window of calm, clear days wasn't upon them yet. The IMAX team felt the conditions were okay, but not great. Ed said we'd be idiots to force it and go now in unsettled weather. And that's exactly when the other teams were heading up. Climbers were relieved to get to Camp 3. It was quite windy and Lena described it as being so fierce she was being thrown off her feet and had to cling to a rock to avoid being thrown off the mountain. If this wind kept up, many assumed that their summit bid would just be off. There's no way they could climb it in this weather. It was just too miserable. As Rob's team was heading up this section, guide Andy Harris was suddenly struck in the chest by a boulder the size of a small TV. It threw him off of his feet, knocked the wind out of him, and left him dangling from the fixed lines. He wasn't hurt, but he was shocked and realized that if that boulder hit his head, he would have been killed instantly. Dangers lurking all around on Everest. At Camp 3, Scott shared a tent with Sandy and Neil. Sandy had her satellite phone here so she could call NBC from up high on the mountain. And if you've seen my other video on Sandy Hill Pittman, you'll see in the comments that this is another bone of contention with those critical of her. And the reports have said that the equipment weighed about 20 to 40 pounds that was brought up the mountain for her by Sherpas. And the equipment didn't even work past Camp 3, so it was kind of a waste of time to bring it all the way up there. Anatoly did say that she hired her own Sherpas for hauling of her gear, but on this subject, even Krakauer admits that the person who was ultimately responsible for her equipment being hauled up that high on the mountain was the leader, Scott. Sandy was able to phone in her dispatch from here and was barely able to talk because of the <coughs> cough she had developed. She told them they were melting water, eating red licorice, and that the IMAX team had turned back. If she or anyone else was concerned that two of the highest regarded Everest veterans had turned back, no one mentioned it. Krakauer took note of his teammates at Camp 3. Lou was so tired that Rob was carrying his pack. 
Lou looked pale and distraught and said he was just finished. He was completely out of gas. Frank Fishbeck, one of the more experienced climbers who had attempted Everest three times and almost made it to the summit, showed up a few minutes later. He looked even more exhausted than Lou. Krakauer said it was a shock to see them like this since they'd been climbing so well. And Lou recalled how exhausted he was here, too. He said they were all suffering. He said everyone was quiet, even Beck, who had been known to be quite chatty. There were chunks of ice from the Lotzi face falling down and smashing into the tent walls, and he said, Who would have known on May 8th that I would not sleep or even just rest again for four days and nights? If I had known about the nightmare I was facing, I would happily have packed up and bailed out. And he questioned why anyone would ever want to climb Mount Everest. And now they faced a decision about whether to keep going for the summit. Anatoly was concerned about the wind velocity and he didn't think they should go. He discussed this with Scott and Rob and Rob disagreed. And Scott said that he was going to follow Rob's lead. Anatoly said that in two decades of climbing, he'd developed a certain intuition and his feeling was that things were just not right. He said for several days the weather had not been stable and he really wanted his feelings to be heard, but it's clear that Scott didn't listen to him the same way that he did Rob. Scott was less experienced on Everest than Rob. This is his first time guiding clients up it. And so he may have just deferred to Rob at that point. And you can't help but think how the competition between the two affected their decision making. As they settled in for the evening and tried to sleep before the summit bid, Rob urged them to use oxygen throughout the night. He said, every minute you remain at this altitude, your minds and bodies are deteriorating. Brain cells are dying. Blood is growing dangerously thick. Capillaries and retinas can hemorrhage, and oxygen would help slow this decline and help them sleep. The climb to Camp 4 is about 3 to 5 hours. It's only 365 meters or 1,200 feet of gain, and it's mostly over flat, hard-packed snow and ice, but it's approaching the death zone. The angle is suddenly steeper, and there's fixed lines, but you move slowly and carefully, trying to avoid a mistake that would leave you at the bottom of a crevasse. As they head further up, climbers are mostly on rock. The climbing so far has been on snow and ice, so they must have careful foot placement and stay focused. One slip without being clipped in could mean a 1,500 meter or 5,000 foot free fall. As they were climbing to Camp 4, unbeknownst to the two teams, the first fatal accident occurred below them. Chen Yu Nan, a 36-year-old steel worker, crawled out of his tent to go to the bathroom in only his boot liners. He quickly lost his balance and went flying down the Lotzi face into a crevasse. Luckily, his teammates saw it happen and they were able to rescue him, and he seemed okay at the time, but he was going to go down, obviously, because he was injured. Sherpas started to help him down the mountain, but he must have suffered from internal injuries because he soon lost consciousness. The IMAX team rushed up to see if they could help him, but it was too late. Lou said what makes climbing different from any other sport is the heavy punishment for one mistake. And the most common mistake? is a momentary loss of concentration. And for that, Chen paid the ultimate price. Krakauer woke up that morning lethargic and groggy. He'd assumed that Lou and Frank would not continue on, but they were already up the ropes when he got there. As he joined his teammates, he looked down to see a line of approximately 50 people climbing up the single rope. He picked his pace and tried to keep ahead of the line. He was able to leapfrog past others ahead of him, but it was nerve-wracking and exhausting. Anatoly was the last to leave camp, and he also took note of the huge amount of climbers ahead. His progress was slowed as he had to maneuver around everybody. His plan was to get to Camp 4 first so he could make sure everything was ready for the clients. The death zone is at 8,000 meters or 26,246 feet, and Camp 4 is just below that. Krakauer said that once climbers get to Camp 4, they're constantly dehydrated and can no longer sleep or eat. The thought of food becomes repugnant to most people. Your body has a hard time digesting anything if you do manage to swallow something. And climbers also burn about 12,000 calories a day. Camp 4 is located on the South Coal, which is a broad notch between the upper parts of Lhotse and Everest. 
It's rectangular in shape and is about four football fields long by two across. Each edge drops thousands of feet and meters into Tibet or Nepal. The tents are on a patch of barren ground surrounded by more than a thousand discarded oxygen canisters. Anatoly got to camp for around 2 p.m. and it was absolute pandemonium. The wind was blowing more than 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour and it was tearing across the exposed plateau. Sherpas were struggling to set up tents so Anatoly was helping them and they had to scream to hear each other over the roaring wind. He said that the squall was just trying to rip them off the mountain. Lena and Martin arrived looking tired but with no serious issues. Anatoly said Neil looked like he was starting to feel the altitude. Lena recalls that when she arrived, she was exhausted. And she found out here that Lopsang was really sick. He arrived coughing and vomiting, but he said this was normal for him at high altitude. He had arrived here carrying an 80-pound load, 30 of it, which was Sandy's satellite phone and hardware. Lena pointed out how you don't think clearly at that altitude, and you believe you're rational and making the most intelligent decisions. But you can't be sure because your brain is so oxygen deprived. She mentioned how other teams, when they had to make a demanding decision, they'd radio base camp and talk to their team down there who were more capable of thinking straight. She says she wishes Scott's team had done it that way. But they had these subpar radios that didn't work very well, and they only had two of them. They actually only had sporadic radio communication above camp too, which is insane because guides need to be in contact with each other when they're spread out on the mountain. As the afternoon wore on, the winds increased exponentially. Anatoly talked to Rob about the weather and Rob said that in his experience, it's often calm after a storm like that. He said, if it clears in the night, we'll make our summit bid later. But if the weather doesn't change, We'll wait 24 hours. And if the weather's bad after that second day, we'll descend. Anatoly didn't think the weather would stabilize at all. He fully expected that they wouldn't climb later that night. Scott arrived and Anatoly told him about the discussion with Rob. And he reiterated that he just didn't feel the conditions were good enough and that they should consider going down. But once again, Scott agreed with Rob, despite Anatoly's advice. Krakauer said the winds here can be stronger than at the summit because the wind accelerates as it squeezes through this V-shaped valley. The teams tried resting in their tents, but the flapping of the tents and anxiety about the summit bid made sleep impossible. Lou, Beck, Andy, and Doug Hansen were trying to rest in their tent, but the winds hammered them too, making it impossible to rest. And they were supposed to leave in three hours for the summit. Lou said there's no way we can leave in a few hours. They needed all four of them inside the tent to keep it down. They debated the issue in the tent and everyone agreed that they just weren't going to make the summit bid. Lou didn't think it was a difficult decision to make because the weather was so horrible. And May 10th is their summit day. That was kind of an arbitrary number anyways. They didn't have to do it on that day. Other than it being Rob's lucky day, they really didn't have to go up that night at all. And Lou felt, like others, that there had been no precedent for stable weather up high, so it was more likely to be hostile than not. Doug was sleeping beside Beck, and Beck noticed that he was really sick and hadn't been climbing well. Doug hadn't been eating, drinking, or resting like the others. Something was off. Beck said Doug had almost become obsessed with summiting since 1995 when Rob made him turn back just before the summit. It ruled his every waking thought. And he came back to Everest this year and vowed that under no circumstance was he going to be turned around again. Beck's personal goal was only to get as far as the South Pole, and he was there now, so he was pretty happy about that. He felt that if he didn't make it to the top, it was still worth it. He said, the one thing you must ask yourself is how much do you have left in the tank? Can you still turn around and get back safely? It's an obligation to your fellow climbers as well as yourself. He didn't think that Doug knew this any longer or even cared. Beck was also concerned about Yasuko Namba, the 47-year-old Japanese woman. She was very small, only about 90 pounds, and he was concerned that she had to carry the same gear as everyone else, including those big oxygen tanks. Anatoly chatted with Lena and Clev Schoening, who was the nephew of Pete, who had turned back and gone to back to base camp. They all thought a summit bid just wouldn't happen that night. 
The climb from Camp 4 to the balcony usually takes four to six hours. Climbers leave the south Col and it's a few hundred yards to the start of the fixed ropes. From there, the route goes straight up the icy slope with angles of 30 to 50 degrees. The balcony is a spot where climbers pick up a new oxygen bottle and swap it out with an old one. Later that evening on May 9th, the winds actually calmed, but they still hadn't seen that good consistent weather window. Rob came to Lou's tent and told them to all be ready to climb at 11 p.m. Now Lou wasn't okay with this plan to go, but each climber kind of had their own individual decision to make on whether to go or not. They didn't have to go, it was their own decision. Only each of them knew their own personal limits, and the level of risk they were willing to take was an individual thing. Lou wondered about that weather window. What evidence did they have that it had opened? But everyone else started getting ready, so Lou got ready too. But he had this sick feeling in his stomach that Rob made the wrong decision. As they left, Lou overheard Rob talking to base camp. He said, we're going, all are strong, and we're gonna set some world records. Yasuka would be the oldest woman to summit Everest, and Rob would be summiting for the fifth time. But those were the only records that Lou was aware of. He thought about it and wondered if Rob was really going for a record for the largest number of people from one expedition to summit on a single day. Lou felt Rob was record-oriented in that he knew the publicity value of world records. New records would help his business grow. Meanwhile, Krakauer and his teammates got ready in their tents. They were each going to be carrying two 6.6-pound oxygen tanks, and each person would pick up the third tank higher on the mountain. So Rob's team started out from Camp 4, an hour ahead of the Mountain Badness team. And now we're going to talk about the infamous short roping incident. So what is short roping, some of you may be wondering? Well, according to the Climber's Handbook, which is supposed to be the Bible of short roping, who knew that that even existed? <laughs> short roping is when a guide, who is the more confident person, and a client, the less confident person either through inexperience, injury, exhaustion, or a variety of other reasons, move together in terrain that is hazardous, joined at the rope for protection or for comfort of the client. According to Anatoly, when Scott's team was leaving Camp 4, Lopsang asked if anyone was ready, and if they were, they should go with him. Sandy stepped forward, and that's when Lopsang tied himself to Sandy. Then they started off, tied together with Lopsang leading Sandy. Krakauer and others also saw the short roping incident and said it lasted for about four to five hours. And this received a lot of criticism because people claim it slowed Lopsang down so he couldn't fix ropes higher up on the mountain, which was one of his jobs. People actually blame the deaths on Sandy because of this single short roping incident, which is kind of crazy because you'll see soon that there's so many more factors involved in this whole tragedy. But the problem with that theory on the short roping incident misses the point that Lopsang was really sick and vomiting and wasn't able to do his normal duties. He was moving much more slowly than usual even before the short roping incident. When asked about this later, Sandy told Krakauer that she didn't want to be short roped and that it was only for about an hour or two. And that's all she's ever said on this. People asked if Scott told Lopsang to do this to make sure Sandy got to the summit because she was a high profile client. But Lopsang said no, that he usually short roped weaker clients just to help them out, and that was kind of normal practice for him. But ultimately, the actions of Scott's guides and his Sherpas, they were solely his responsibility. Charlotte got out of her tent at Camp 4 and emerged into a calm, cold evening. She said with their big down suits on and the oxygen masks, it was hard to tell who was who. She started off at the front of Scott's pack with Neil ahead of her. They quickly caught up to Rob's team and were pretty frustrated as they were held back and immediately slowed down. Lena left with the first part of Scott's team and she and Scott wished each other good luck and she gave him a hug before she left. Scott would be the sweep at the rear. Both him and Rob were kind of doing that with their own teams. They would be the sweeping up the clients from the back and the whole idea was that if they came across somebody who was really struggling, they would turn them back and make them go back down. And at this point, you got to remember, it was dark. It was middle of the night. It was steep and hard to see as they navigated their way in this new area, which they'd never been before. They had to go across ice and there was crevasses all around them. Lena said that you had to concentrate really hard here 
Just taking one step at a time. Focus on the person in front of you and don't let the fear take over. There was no safety line here at the start, which surprised her because this was very exposed and risky. But then they finally got to the area where the fixed rope started and she let out a sigh of relief. She clipped in and climbed upwards. Even with oxygen, she said it was madly exhausting. She caught up with Lopsang, who was coughing and ill, and was kind of surprised that nobody did anything about it. He just kept climbing. She didn't mention anything about him short roping Sandy at that time, so I'm not sure if he was here and she just didn't mention it, or if he wasn't short roping her anymore. They all progressed at a snail's pace. The fixed ropes then came to an end and Lena was terrified. She was scared of falling and also continuously wondering how she was going to get back down again. They got to a spot where the snow was so deep that they sank in up to their hips in several places, so it gives you an idea of how difficult this was. All she could think was just, if there was an avalanche, it would all be over. She could see the mountain ranges all over Nepal and said it was a beautiful sight, but it was terrifying. She was profoundly conscious of being in the death zone, and she fully understood at that moment how people die up there. There is zero margin for error. And within two or three hours of leaving, both teams and the Taiwanese now were all mixed together. No one knew the Taiwanese team was going to be summiting that day, but they likely wanted to climb in behind the stronger teams who were breaking trail and fixing ropes. A few hours later, Lou saw Frank and Rob in deep conversation, and then Frank started turning around. He decided to turn back. Now, Frank was a strong climber with a lot of experience, and he was also an independent thinker. Frank had also been vocal earlier about not climbing because of the weather. But at that moment, Lou had no reason to turn around himself. He was just absolutely determined to get to the top. And not long after that, Doug passed Lou heading down the mountain as well. He said that he felt really bad and was very cold. His feet were now more sensitive to the cold since he froze them in 1995, so they were really bothering him. Lou said that Frank and Doug at that moment were making that individual hard decision that Rob expected from each of them. And Doug hadn't acclimatized as well as the rest of them. But he seemed to improve back at base camp, so that's why he was allowed to keep climbing. Other people raised concern about Doug's ability to go to the summit without having slept at Camp 3. But Rob said he wasn't concerned because of how Doug performed in 1995. And this made absolutely no sense to Lou because that was the a year ago, and even then Doug had issues just before the summit. And Doug looked awful as far back as Camp 3. Now on summit day, Doug was doing the best thing for himself based on his own judgment, and that was to turn around. Crack hour, Rob Sherpa Ang Dorje and guide Mike Groom were leading in the hours before dawn. At several places they had come to a stop because Rob instructed them not to put any more than 100 meters or 328 feet between them until they reached the balcony. Crack hour was frustrated by this. He wasn't used to climbing in a team where they were, their speeds were so varied and he had to slow down and stop and wait for people. But he had no choice so they sat and waited. But sitting and waiting means not moving, and that means getting cold and using up valuable oxygen doing nothing. Meanwhile, Beck was motoring along doing pretty good and climbing right behind Ang, Mike, and Krakauer. He gradually realized, though, that he couldn't see very well. After being nearsighted for years, Beck had finally had surgery a year and a half earlier so he could see better in the mountains. But, he said, unbeknownst to him and virtually every other ophthalmologist in the world, at high altitude, the cornea will both flatten and thicken, making you blind. He didn't think it was that bad at the time because he could still sort of see, but not great, and he had no depth perception. But he thought it would improve as the sun came up because he always had trouble seeing in the dark. He didn't tell anybody, but he was too blind to climb, so he stepped out of line and let everyone pass, going from the fourth climber to dead last. And he looked back on it and he said it wasn't unpleasant and that I basically stood there like a Walmart greeter until the sun came up. He was at the balcony when Rob came up behind him. Beck told him that they could go ahead and he'd wander up after them. It was about 7.30 a.m. Rob didn't like that idea. He said that Beck had 30 minutes and if he could climb by then, 
he could climb on, but if he still couldn't see in 30 minutes that there would be no more climbing for him. And Beck accepted that. Beck said if his vision improved, he'd just head back down to Camp 4, and Rob said no to that idea. According to Beck, Rob explicitly told him to stay there and wait because Rob wouldn't know when he came back down if Beck had made it back to camp safely or if he went flying off the mountain. So Beck agreed and said that he'd stay there and wait. It never entered his mind that Rob may never return. Lou climbed by Beck and Beck told him what happened and Lou said he just looked at him and felt nothing for Beck. He says the climb is so physically and mentally difficult and so intense that you only focus on yourself. It overrides everything else. And that's a really fascinating tidbit because people wonder why climbers just walk past injured people or dead bodies. And this is partly why. Lou said when you're suffering from fatigue, malnutrition, dehydration, hypoxia, and sleep deprivation, you don't have much emotional capacity, let alone empathy. But as he looked back on it later, Lou realized that Beck needed help immediately, and there were resources available to help him. He said Rob had a leadership dilemma. Leaving Beck at the balcony meant Rob had all of his guides and Sherpas fully supporting the people going to the summit. But that delayed getting Beck down to safety. Lou felt that if Rob sent Mike or Andy back to short rope Beck down to Camp 4, that would mean less leaders helping people to the summit. That also meant that Mike or Andy wouldn't be able to summit, and Andy had never summited Everest before. And he said their Sherpas were only there to help with logistics. They weren't there to help clients. So Rob decided to handle Beck's problem later and didn't foresee problems or delays up ahead. Lou cites one of the unwritten rules of mountaineering, and that's to not leave a sick or injured climber alone. Plus, another reason it made no sense is that Beck would be out of oxygen before somebody saw him again. Without generating body heat by not moving and no oxygen meant it would be very difficult for him to stay warm. Lou felt that Rob just simply made the wrong decision. But Lou kept climbing because he was actually enjoying the moment now. He said he snapped some photos and headed up to follow the others but didn't realize that his nightmare was about to begin. Cracker got to the balcony at 5.30 a.m. and Anatoly arrived at about 6 a.m. They were more than an hour in front of the rest of Rob's group and he had told his whole team to wait here for each other. So that's another hour of wasted time, energy and delay for the climbers in front. Lou got to the balcony and was somewhat surprised to see Doug there. Doug obviously changed his mind about going back down. Scott's team arrived and they continued climbing shortly after arriving to get ahead of Rob's team. And it was really important here to spread out because after the balcony, passing would be difficult and dangerous. Lou changed his oxygen and noticed his fingers were white. They were very difficult to move and very cold. He thought he had frostbite, but at that point, he didn't even care. He just kept on going. Charlotte says that after they left the balcony, it was like a conga line. It was one step up, then two steps back in the four inches of snow on top of the loose, down-sloping shale. The water they were carrying was beginning to freeze, even though it was in insulated sleeves within their down jackets, so it was very, very cold. The route narrowed from the previous rock and snow face to a ridge toward the summit. Charlotte said the top looked so close, but it was still hours away. The line moved on but slowed again as they arrived at sections needing new fixed rope. The next stretch is from the balcony to the south summit and that takes about three to four hours. Here it gets steeper and can be rocky if the wind has blown away fresh snow. And keep in mind that climbers have their crampons on, which dig into the snow. And so it's more difficult to walk on rock than it is on snow and ice. And this is usually the area where the weather can turn really bad. By this time, the sun was starting to come up and climbers have been out for about eight to 10 hours. Lena says they got to the Southeast Ridge and it was bright sunshine. She noticed that Anatoly looked cold and assumed it was because he wasn't using oxygen because she felt pretty warm. She was happy to be past Rob's team because of their slower speed and she felt starting behind Rob's team and mingling with them on the fixed ropes probably cost him a couple of hours. When Rob's team started up, Lou was in the middle and Rob was at the back again. And this is when Lou realized that he had an issue with his eye protection. 
The oxygen mask kept moving his sunglasses so the bottom of his lenses were just off of his face enough so that he could see the snow below the glass frame. This wasn't good because that meant the sun was reflecting off the snow and into his eyes. And up here at this altitude, the thinner air provides less protection from UV rays. Sun burning the cornea happens and that results in snow blindness, which is a temporary kind of blindness. And Lou was also having issues with his oxygen. He didn't feel like it was working at all. But he didn't want to stop and fix either of those things because he didn't want to slow other people down. And at this point, he admits that he has full-on summit fever. Nothing was going to stop him from going up. Now we're going to talk about the rope fiasco. So let's briefly go back to base camp where Scott, Rob, and their guides met about the rope situation and tried to figure out who would install the ropes up high. And it was decided then that the Sherpas Ang and Lopsang would leave camp four a couple hours ahead of the main group to fix those ropes. This would give them enough time to install the ropes on the most exposed section before the clients arrived so there wouldn't be those lineups. The two points that needed the ropes were uh, the ridge traverse from the south summit to the Hillary step and then on the 40-foot section of the step itself. For some reason, though, no Sherpas headed out in front of the group that night. After the expedition, Lopsang said that Rob and Scott scrapped the plan later because they received information that a previous team who attempted the summit had already completed the job. Crack hour, however, he didn't buy this. He says that if that happened... Mike, Neil, and Anatoly were never told about the change of plans. Plus, the Sherpas brought extra ropes, so he questioned why they would bring ropes if they didn't need it. But then again, one could argue, and Ed Veesters did, he said that it's not uncommon to bring extra rope just in case you need it. Lou said in the previous several days, at least three teams had made unsuccessful attempts at the summit, and one team climbed all the way to the Hillary step before turning back, so ropes only needed to be fixed at the step. Lou needed to stop and take a break, so he sat down and had a rest, and that's when he saw Rob coming up. He said Rob was shaking, and he looked really cold, and he wasn't his normal, strong self. The south summit to the actual summit is about one to two hours, and the ridge from the south summit to the Hillary Step is one of the most exposed and dangerous sections of the climb. The narrow ridge drops thousands of feet on either side, and it's only the size of a sidewalk. At 10 a.m., Neil made it to the south summit and was followed 30 minutes later by Martin. And this is there where there was another big delay because more ropes were needed here. Martin said that he and Neil waited there for almost two hours. And now there was this huge jam of people waiting. Rob's clients were mixed in with Scott's and the faster clients couldn't pass here. And Martin was frustrated not moving. He was well aware that he was using up precious oxygen, waiting. When Anatoly got there, he saw Martin, Neil, Ang, Tim, Mike, and a few others, but no one was moving. He said it seemed like they had no desire to move ahead. Everyone's strength was diminishing, so nobody was really keen to keep on going. Anatoly began to wonder where Scott was and said that he thought the clients might have to be turned around here, but there was no Scott to do it. Anatoly and Neil both felt that they didn't have the right to turn people around, and the only ones at the radios were Scott and Lopsang, neither of which were here. Crack Era arrived here to find a worse lineup than the last one. He sat down with Andy, Neil, and Anatoly to wait for the Sherpas to fix ropes along this ridge. Krakauer admitted he was now in a hypoxia stupor and completely lost track of time. He said none of them paid attention to the Sherpas from Rob's team sitting beside them, sharing a thermos of tea with no interest or hurry to keep going. Around 11.40, Neil asked the Sherpas if they were going to fix the ropes, and they said no. Krakauer thought it was maybe because of Scott Sherpas who were not there to share the work. And then as the crowd grew, Neil finally suggested that he, Andy, and Anatoly fix the ropes. And Lou had something to say about this rope situation. He felt that the guides had a clear and simple choice on what to do. The best choice was to continue climbing without fixing new rope on this short ridge traverse to the Hillary Step. Lou felt that no rope was needed, and he said they all knew that in previous years, people climbed this section without it. It was exposed, but it was straightforward and not difficult. If they really wanted a new rope, the only choice was to set it themselves. They had the extra rope, and the work to fix it was not difficult or time-consuming. The other choice was to not continue climbing and just sit there and wait for Sherpas to do the work for them. And Lou says that's what they did. They sat on their butts and waited. 
Minutes ticked by, then hours, then finally two hours were lost. Doing nothing, burning daylight, one of the most precious and critical resources on summit day. Krakauer was sitting there with three professional guides and they lost track of time waiting for the Sherpas to fix ropes. Lou wondered why no one had a sense of leadership in that moment. Waiting is never part of the plan at that altitude. There were now 28 climbers piled together at the south summit. Mike was there for the entire two hours and said Rob had given him instructions not to get involved with the ropes. Before noon, he tried calling Rob on the radio, but he couldn't get through. Lou said this came down to Rob's leadership being a one-man band. He said the climber's inaction and decision to wait was much more consequential to the outcome than the Sherpa's failure to set ropes. Lou was convinced that Lopsang was slowed down by altitude sickness and that it was ridiculous for the other climbers, including guides, to sit and wait for him to come and fix the ropes. For one Sherpa, if they had fixed it for themselves right away, they would have stayed spread out all the way to the summit and back. And the new rope that everyone was waiting for never was fixed. All Anatoly did was reach down and pull up an old rope that was buried in the snow. It took minutes. All the waiting was for nothing. Lena corroborates using these old ropes and said that expeditions had the best intentions to put up their own ropes here, but at this point, you don't care as long as there's something to grab onto. I would be requesting a brand spanking new rope. <laughs> Lena said that she came to a standstill for what seemed like hours, almost nodding off while hanging onto the rope before they got moving again. As Lou was waiting in line at the South Summit, he saw John Tasky coming down. Then another teammate, Stu, started coming down as well. These were two of the team's strongest and smartest climbers. Stu said that it's just too late, there's too many people, and I need to go down now or get caught out. And being caught out means being caught out in the open after dark, which is a climber's worst fear at that altitude. This hit Lou pretty hard because he respected these guys, but he told Stu that he just wasn't ready to turn around yet. Stu and John Tasky, they were tough, ambitious climbers that Lou respected and neither would go down so close to the summit without important reasons behind that decision. But Lou said that he didn't even want to think about turning around then. He was programmed for six weeks straight to get to the summit. And he asked a Sherpa how much longer and the Sherpa told him two hours and that was way longer than Lou thought. It was now close to noon and they'd been climbing for 13 hours and they were behind schedule. They were very, very late. Lou did the math in his head. Two more hours to get to the top would be 2 p.m. plus six hours back in ideal conditions. That puts them at camp four at 8 p.m. Way too late and in the dark. Based on Rob's summit plan, it was now too late. They were out of time, but others were still going up. So Rob must think it's okay, Lou thought. So he thought, I guess I can do this too. Lou felt physically and mentally wasted, yet he kept going. He said, in climbing, the only thing worse than not making the summit is when others do and you don't. Then something frightening happened to Lou. His heart started to race and pound. It seemed like it was out of control. He had no idea what was happening and he suddenly dropped to his knees. Instantly, he had this new, wider perspective. He knew that he could make it to the summit, but he wasn't sure he'd get back down now. Looking up, things were looking okay, but below him, visibility was poor and the wind was getting stronger. Lou felt the weather was changing and not for the better. His only thought was, I should turn around now. Others are counting on me to stick to the turnaround time. And he also promised his wife that he would only live a story that he could tell. Climbers kept passing him, heading up the mountain, oblivious to the danger, but no one said a word. There was more pressure to keep going, but Lou knew he had to make a hard choice right now. And then all of a sudden, everything got very quiet. He knew at that moment that he had to turn around. So he did just that. And the second he turned around and took his first step downhill, his heart stopped pounding. He felt at peace and knew instantly that he made the right choice. Five out of eight clients on Rob's team made this really hard decision on their own. Before noon, Mike was at the South Summit with Yasuko. He didn't want to continue unless he talked to Rob because he was concerned, like Lou, that it was too late to continue. Rob got to the South Summit at noon and looked around. 
everything was at stake now. And what Rob did next, Lou believes, is the 1996 Everest story. Rob's team continued on. The Hillary Step is a near vertical rock face around 12 meters or 40 feet high. After 12 hours of climbing, it's a huge challenge for climbers physically and psychologically. And it's a common turnaround point for climbers. There are so many fixed ropes that it can get confusing on which is which. Ropes from previous years are rarely removed and they're frozen and brittle and shouldn't be used. And only one climber at a time should be climbing here. Anatoly went up first, tying on to existing anchors placed by earlier expeditions and setting the rope. Neil came up after him, followed by Andy and Krakauer. Anatoly went ahead to lead and break trail while Neil finished fixing the ropes. Krakauer was increasingly worried about his oxygen supply and asked Neil if he could hurry ahead to the summit and leave the fixing of ropes to him. Neil agreed and Martin ended up helping him. Climbers were now all bunched together because of all the waiting. Mike discussed the weather when Rob got there and the winds were increasing and clouds were starting to develop below. Rob said that it'll be all right provided it doesn't get worse, which doesn't sound very reassuring. According to Lou, Rob and Doug were here in 1993 when there was a long delay of only six climbers in front of them. If six were significant for a delay, what about 28? And on that day in 1993, a record number of 40 climbers made it to the summit. But the critical difference was that climbers started reaching the summit at 9.30 a.m. and finished by 1 p.m. Now teams had no chance of reaching the summit by 2 p.m. at this rate, and everyone's oxygen was getting low. They might not have enough to get back to Camp 4. And the crazy coincidence is that Rob faced this exact decision at the same time on the exact same day one year earlier. At 12.30 p.m. on the same day in 1995, Rob's team was at the south summit with no other climbers above or below. They faced no delays or weather issues, but they were behind schedule. They were simply out of time. Rob stuck with the turnaround time and turned back. But last year, there was no pressure of a rider on the team or competition from another team. So this year, Rob kept going, with Mike, Doug, and Yasuko following him. Lou said if Rob's team was unable to reach the summit two years in a row, that would have major impacts on his business, especially if Scott's team reached the summit. Lou says some of the strongest voices were spoken when the strongest, most experienced climbers turned around. And the strongest and loudest voice was that of Beck, who was still standing alone and waiting at the balcony. Charlotte talks about huffing and puffing up the Hillary step and says it was strenuous but not that difficult, which is hilarious because they've been climbing for 13 hours and they've been doing this for weeks on end and for her not to find it difficult is just amazing. But once they got past that, they emerged onto this broad slanted summit ridge and there it was, the summit. Anatoly got to the summit at 1.07 p.m with more a sense of relief than celebration. And while it was considerably later than he would have liked to have arrived, he thought that if the clients followed quickly, they'd all be able to make it up soon. Krakauer was second and he got there at 1.12 p.m., finally obtaining a goal he'd had since childhood. But he knew the summit was only the halfway point. He said, any impulse I had towards self-congratulating myself was extinguished by the overwhelming apprehension about the long, dangerous descent. Martin noticed that Neil seemed like he was moving a little slow and he asked Martin to turn up his oxygen bottle. When they were almost to the summit, he asked him to turn up even more and Martin just cranked it up all the way. About 1.25, Martin and Neil made it to the summit. At 1.45 p.m., Clev made it to the summit and Anatoly took his photo. After his arrival, the traffic to the summit stopped and by 2 p.m., no more climbers had arrived. Anatoly was starting to become concerned. He said that everyone on the team that he saw on the summit looked good and was in no danger and he had no concern about them. But he began to wonder where everybody else was. And right at this time, the IMAX team was back at camp too. They'd been monitoring the progress at the summit through a telescope and they could see climbers still going up at 2 p.m. Ed said, we just saw them standing there and moving very slow. 
and we could see streamer clouds going over the top and I'm going, God, it's way too late. They're really pushing it. Not only was it late, but you only have 18 hours of oxygen. So they called down to Rob's base camp and asked what the turnaround time was and they told them 2 p.m but two o'clock had come and gone. Henry Todd, with another expedition also at Camp 2, he knew about the psychology that they must have been experiencing. He said that you're absolutely knackered at that point. You stop being logical and think you can hack it. Martin knew he was running out of oxygen, so he didn't hang around on the summit for very long. As he started to descend, he passed Charlotte, Lena, Sandy, and Tim in four Mountain Madness Sherpas, including Lopsang. Anatoly was on the summit for about an hour. Neither he or Neil had a radio, so they had no idea what was going on below. Anatoly thought there might be trouble at the Hillary Steps, so he felt that he should go down to see what was going on. And he ran into Rob on the way down, so he asked Rob if he needed any help, and Rob said no and thanked him for his work on the rope. Then Anatoly saw the Mountain Madness climbers coming up, and he realized they'd been climbing 14 hours on 18 hours of oxygen if they were using it properly. They were still 30 minutes away from the summit and would not make it back down on that last oxygen bottle. Meanwhile, Neil was on the summit and very nervous and anxious. He wanted to leave much earlier, but every time he got up to go, another wave of people came up the mountain. He didn't feel it was right to leave until everyone had reached the summit. And finally, between 2.15 and 2.30, the Mountain Madness clients made it to the summit. It was the most challenging part of the day for Sandy as the last of her oxygen drained from her third bottle. Lopsang gave her an extra bottle that he had for emergencies. Charlotte was elated. The never-ending ridge finally ended and she was on the summit. A stiff wind was blowing but the sky was blue and she also felt more relief than elation and also a deep fear. She realized that this was not a place meant for humans. She checked her watch and it was 2.15. Anatoly said Scott had not turned back any clients because he never made contact with any of them after he last saw Lena earlier that day. By now, there were no more climbers to sweep, no place for them to go but down. But no one moved off the summit until 3.10 p.m. There were 40 minutes of celebration, picture taking, tears, and congratulations. That's 40 minutes less oxygen and 40 minutes less daylight. Anatoly ran into Scott around 2.30 while Scott was resting after climbing the Hillary Step. Scott said he was really tired and that the ascent had been difficult. Anatoly felt that in that moment, the most logical thing for him to do was to descend to Camp 4 as quickly as possible and to stand by in case the climbers needed to be resupplied with oxygen. He would also prepare hot tea and warm drinks. He also said that he'd have a clear view from Camp 4 of the climbing route so he could observe developing problems with the climbers. He says Scott agreed to this plan at the time and neither had any cause for concern about the weather. And the people on the summit thought the same thing. They said that there was a strong wind, but it really didn't intensify or wasn't getting worse. However, Lena, she saw something disturbing. She said before she went up the steps, she noticed a whiteout coming from the valleys below and saw the wind pick up over the summit. And that was a bad sign. So they started the descent. And this is when Charlotte first noticed clouds blowing up from below. They'd seen this pattern regularly in the last month. The clouds would rise up in the afternoon and roll up towards the icefall. And these clouds did look a little more black and menacing, but Charlotte thought at least we're heading back down to safety they were actually heading into their worst nightmare. We'll cover this final harrowing descent in the next part, in part three, coming very soon. So stay tuned and thanks for watching.